Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and today I'm very excited to have a really cool roundtable on mini cuts. Uh, mini cuts are something that a lot of us bodybuilders, physique competitors have probably used. Many of you maybe have heard about them, and I think they're something that's definitely worth discussing because I think there may be a small part of a kind of bodybuilder's off-season periodization, but can be really beneficial, but also can be detrimental in certain circumstances and i wanted to get alberto and jared on because both of them have used mini cuts i've seen both of them talk about them in very intelligent ways and i wanted to basically get them to bounce some ideas off one another share some knowledge i know uh, alberto for a time was known for the war on mini cuts um as he did a, a vlog on that and also jared has been part of the the mini cut manual which rp produced and uh, both of them have some really good insights so i don't know if Alberto, you want to start off with your definition of a mini cut, and then Jared can kind of come in if he thinks anything different. Yeah, it's essentially a fat loss phase. It just um, allows you to keep going without getting too carried away with uh, with the body fat. So usually, we're talking about um, five percent of your body weight will be lost, and how much time? Well, it kind of depends on the person. I think the more experience you are probably the faster we can run it um you know for someone who's a little bit newer to it sometimes maybe it might take twice as long but generally speaking five percent of your body weight and we're trying to take somewhere between we'll say ideally four to four to eight weeks yeah yeah so everything alberto touched on is really good uh our general definition is that this is not a sustainable fat loss period this is a, a period in time in which we're potentiating weight gain. Uh, we're in temporarily improving appearance. And like he said, uh, 5% is pretty, pretty good estimation. The mini cuts should probably last anywhere from two to six weeks uh, long. And depending on how long it is, is how aggressive you should probably pair that to. So if you're going to go two to three weeks, maybe 1.25% body weight rate loss is fine. If you're going to go six weeks, which is my top end, I would say six weeks. I think anything past six weeks, you're going to run into some issues because of the volume that you're doing in the gym. Uh, you could potentially run into muscle loss. And if you're going more to that four to six week length, 0.75% uh, per week is probably fine uh, as far as the rate of loss goes, which is a little bit more aggressive than a, a general fat loss diet, which it's supposed to be. Like I said, you know, if you go any slower, it'd probably result in significant fast, not much fat loss over uh, that period of time. And if you go much faster, it'd probably risk, risk a little bit of muscle loss again, like I said. So. Cool. Alberto, you're on board with kind of the, the length, if it's longer, go a bit kind of less aggressive for that period of time, slow that things down. If it's short, like you can go pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think ideally you, you want to get to, to the point where, yeah, you can go pretty hard and it's pretty short and you can keep your, your gaining momentum going. It's, you know, to me, yes. especially fighting and it's not a show, I'm like, man, this is like time I can be spent like improving, you know? Um, right. So you don't, got out any longer than you need to yeah uh one thing i did want to touch on i think that the prerequisite knowledge before we even touch on these is that and you you did mention this but they're not for most people at all <laughs> they're not for uh strength sport athletes who are trying to make weight caps they're not for general population they're for advanced people in physique sport who do not have a, a history of psychological issues toward food um who are very, very uh, nuanced with their approaches, very uh, on point with everything. And if you're gonna do a mini cut, you should probably take at least two times the length of the mini cut as a break before starting another one, if you're gonna do them se sequentially uh, in order to recover enough physiologically to reduce the diet fatigue that is coming with those. So that on top of knowing that you're probably gonna be running these blind because there is a body water drop, what we call noise, which clouds that traditional body weight loss feedback mechanism that we really kind of go off of. So usually in general fat loss diets, we're going off this body weight feedback, which is really good um, generally. But if you take someone who's 200 pounds and they go into an aggressive diet that much, there's, there's a huge noise and body water drop right from the start, maybe up to seven pounds. You got to think about how many grams of water are pulled in by a gram of carbohydrate. 
So we have to just kind of trust thermodynamics. We should know our maintenance at this point because again, we're advanced. These are advanced physique sport athletes. We should have a very, very good idea where our maintenance is currently. And that can give you an equation to set up to go into a deficit depending on what your rate of loss is going to be. So again, trusting thermodynamics <laughs> is very important. And in the mini cut manual, if you don't know your maintenance or you're close to your maintenance and you think you just kind of want to double check, we do have a, a huge chart of like people who are this to this, generally here's their maintenance, this to this, generally here's their maintenance, male and female. Um, it's, it's going to be a big trusting process because of the body water noise. Um, so all those caveats to this discussion, keep them in mind. And I think we're good. Yeah. What I do think you think? Oh, yeah. Going on oh, right absolutely. Um, yeah, like I, right now, when I do uh, a mini cut, like it's, it's, I feel like crap. I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. This is, this is working. This is, this is, this is going really great right now. I, and sometimes it can even be worse than most of like what a contest prep diet is because, you know, a contest prep diet, fat loss, like it's because of where you're going, it's kind of in the background happening. Whereas like a, a mini cut, no, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that you're, you're being underfed, you know? For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you're going to feel like shit toward him probably. And I think, you know, that might strike something in somebody's head, like, well, then how do you know if you're actually, uh, if you're not losing too fast? I think that if the time frames that we gave in the beginning relative to the rate of loss, uh, which is just going to be based on thermodynamics and the actual equation you use to get you into that deficit that you need is a really good uh, starting point. Another good predictor is that if you're, calculated maintenance volume for, which we'll probably get into later, uh, what training is going to look like. If your kind of intuitive calculated maintenance volume for this mini cut, which is generally your minimum effective volume for like a mass and phase. Um, if you're not recovering from that, maybe it's too aggressive, potentially too aggressive. Um, but you are going to feel like shit. So you can't just be like, well, I feel like shit. So it's too aggressive. Because like Alberto said, it's definitely good. You're going to feel that way. Yeah, I think what you've outlined there and i'm glad we've put it out there from the beginning in terms of we kind of talked about uh, for physique competitors for people in their off season but i think it's super important that you outlined it's for people who like they've been through many fat loss phases before they're skilled it's kind of like i would talk about it like driving like just a general car versus like a formula one race vehicle if you've just got no experience driving whatsoever you're not going to go for the fastest thing because that's going to lead to some potential damages along the way so i think that's super important to have outlined that and i i think that is something kind of alberto talked about in terms of off season and momentum and potentially abusing mini cuts to stay a little bit too lean because of like a psychological need potentially. I'd love to hear you kind of touch on that a little bit more, Alberto. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the the warm mini cuts was just basically it's because it, people were, were abusing of that button. I, I don't think the majority of people were running mini cuts per se, like as as we have described, uh, but they were just pressing the fat loss button whenever. You know, they did get to the point where they just, you know, they didn't look as good as they did, you know, during the peak of their leanness, whatever that that might be. So for a lot of these folks, it was not even competitors. Competitors, I think, especially now more than ever, they, they kind of get it, you know. And um, once they've been there a few times, they're like, okay, like, I, I, I need to invest. I need to put my coin away in order to, to, to see some you know, some returns that are worth my time. But uh, it was, yeah, it was usually the, the noob that would, as soon as, because when it comes to fat storage, like everyone, everyone has their spot, you know? And it's like, yeah, you know, I've been hitting PRs like crazy, but like, it's the spot, you know, it's like like my, my back fat, my, uh, my, my, my stomach, whatever it might be. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, so for, I think usually when it comes to, so like physique athletes who, again, it's like, I'm going to compete in 12 months. I'm going to compete in 18, 24, whatever. Um, usually they got a better handle on that because they know that time is limited before they, you know, have to run that long contest prep diet again. But um, yeah, usually uh, the abusers were people who still kind of do this to, I guess, wear their, their muscles as, as accessories, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that. I've, I've been there and I enjoyed rocking those, but, but yeah, it's, it was usually that crowd. Do you have a general kind of 
rule of thumb of how the ratio of kind of mass length to when you might incorporate a mini cut, how kind of infrequently would you like to see them generally used? Because obviously it's going to be individual dependent. Um, so, man, this is the first time I heard of the word mini cut was it was Lane Norton's Inside the Life of a Natural Pro Bodybuilder. And he was running, I think it was like four weeks gaining, two weeks cutting, four weeks gaining, two weeks cutting. And, uh, and honestly, to me, what seemed most appealing about this, like, I never have to get that fat, you know? Um, so I, I, th I definitely think that that is, um, yeah, uh, that, that ratio doesn't work relative to, when you think about like how slow muscle gain happens and how relatively fast, you know, fat loss does occur. So, uh, but, but nevertheless, the word mini cut, I, I don't think he gets credit for that one. That was, that was Lane's baby, like way back in actually the early 2000s. Um, so personally, um, I like somewhere in the vicinity of, you know what, we can mini cut anywhere between usually what ends up happening is every, we'll say six to 10 months, um, is, is usually the going rate. Um, and for most people, it takes a while before they even make it to the six month mark. Um, to be honest, because it's hard to gain in a lean manner. Um, for most of us, I mean, all three of us here, so, you know, we have a pretty good handle on that. Like we know more or less where we're going to be in two months, four months, six months, and we, we hardly ever miss it. But for someone who is a little bit newer at this, you know, they have great intentions. They know where they want to go. They, they understand how the big picture works. They're very serious about their competing. Um, usually it takes me a while before we can get to the point that we, we make it to the six month mark. And, um, yeah, often it takes a few tries. So somewhere between every six to 10 months, I think is, is appropriate. Yeah. On the, the point of lane, I remember reaching out to Eric Helms because the first time I heard about mini cuts was from 3DMJ and I was going to run a group coaching, which we've just relaunched, but group coaching. And I remember asking Eric if I could use the name and he was like, ah, it comes back from lane. So, um, yeah, it's, and I remember Lane running those really kind of brief, like almost mini mass mini cuts at the time. So it's yeah, a throwback to Lane for that one. And I know um, potentially, Jared, you have uh, a different perspective in terms of ratios of how long you'd like to see someone massing for before taking a mini cut. I know you may have slightly differing opinions on rate of gain potentially, and that is where the, the kind of the difference in ratios come from. But I don't want to put words in your mouth. So Oh, yeah, maybe. I'd have to know. Well the way they approach massing and everything, but I actually had no idea. Uh, I think I was maybe a little too young or not into lifting yet uh, to know that Lane Norton TM that I had no idea. Um, that's for sure an excessive amount of mini cutting. <laughs> and I think that's uh, to Alberto's first point there uh, at the beginning of that discussion. I think basically what he's saying is that he's touching on reason number two uh, as to why we say mini cuts uh, or why they should be used, which is an intention intentional weight rebound. So again, psychologically healthy as far as relationship to food goes, uh, physique athletes, the, the, uh, it's probably fine to do. So we're supposed to be using these uh, at the top of our masses when it's like, uh, fuck food. <laughs> I don't want to look at food anymore. You know, so reason number two, intentional weight re rebound, because when you go into that mini cut, like he said, he felt like crap. He got hungry again, finally, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're at the top of the mass and eating sucks, it's potentiating wanting to eat more. So instead of use overusing these, like Alberto said, which what people were doing, and I guess I had no idea that was uh, something that was going on early 2000s or whatever that was. I think I think I was in middle school. Uh, <laughs> I was probably eating everything in sight. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, it's using that to intentionally rebound is, is a, a pretty good tool for people who are able to utilize that tool. You know what I mean? Um, you're basically going from no more food to I want more food. And that gets you over that little hump of massing so you can put on more muscle tissue. Um, Fantastic. To the last point of uh, how long I would, I think six months is a, a decent time frame. Uh, if you're taking into consideration, they just came off a of show prep. If you so basically, what I'm saying is, post show you can run this uh, metabolite intensive uh, block of training because you've already been training with high volumes for quite some time. Since we know that 
uh, the volume during prep or during long cuts is very similar to massing. You kind of just, the gap goes like this as far as what you can recover from and what it takes to make you grow. So when you get into that post-show phase, um, getting some, some muscle growth out of that, that post-show process where you're eating a bunch of food, you're going back up to 10% body fat, et cetera. Uh, it's a good idea to go ahead and just, you know, blast some intensity techniques, have fun with your training, uh, get a bunch of pumps, have a good time. And then you can go into this maintenance period where you're, you know, three to six weeks of maintaining before you try to push more high volume into your massing. Because now you're trying to improve off of that, the show prep. Um, so that's like, you know, five weeks, five weeks, that's already 10 weeks. And then you can mass for 20. Uh, you probably, like you were saying, Steve, you wanted to run four consecutive massing mesa cycles before you uh, did a mini cut. And I think it's a fine thing to do, especially if you're coming off of a really deep cut or a show prep or something of that nature. But after that, I don't think uh, mini cutting sh should be, you know, uh, six months or 10 months down the line past that point. And I don't even know if I would run mini cuts consecutively, to be honest. I might run that first mini cut after 20 weeks of massing or so, and then do 10 to 15 more weeks of massing followed by a maintenance period and an actual cut so that we can potentiate more massing later or potentiate the show prep or whatever it may be that you're doing after that. Uh, because that's a pretty long process, you know, six to eight to 10 months or whatever that was that uh, someone was trying to grow. And now they, they're probably either if they're advanced ready for another show prep or if they're beginner to intermediate, they're ready for, you know, a traditional diet where they're losing at a slower pace and then massing some more. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to really gather steam and uh, grow grow the, the most amount of tissue that you could. Alberto, uh, I guess we didn't oh. touch on percentages. Uh, Alberto, did you say anything about percentages? No, 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 I did not go over. So I think that that probably happens anywhere. In the book, we say 10 to 15 for males. I think 10 to 18 is fine. I think you can mass 20 weeks, 10 to 18 percent body fat, uh, 10 to 15, 10 to 16, whatever it may be. And then females, you know, 16 to 25 or whatever that is um and then by the time you get to the top there are some reasons why we would want to cut down uh, we can get into those later um but as far as your all's percentages what, what would you say alberto what do you when do you guys feel like you should run mini cuts um man i'm pessimistic with body fats so i'd say i'll, I'll let sure. a strength athlete uh, a male get up there close to 20 maybe a little bit up, like I think I'm pretty close to 20 right now. Um, and females probably flirt with 30 a little bit as well. Um, the, the depending, I think also it depends on like how stubborn you are. So if you're someone who's like extremely lower body fat dominant and you are a competitor, uh, I'm gonna be a little bit more careful. I'm like, you know what? I think it's really in our best interest to develop fantastic habits. And maybe for them, it might be a little bit closer to, we top out at like 15-ish, you know, which I think is still right. pretty fair. Yeah, yeah and then, you know, there's genetic variance in uh, how much muscle somebody's going to put on anyway. So if you take that into consideration, you, somebody might be pushing body fat and it's probably fine. Um, I think people who put on muscle a little better, staying within that that uh, middle range is potentially a little better, especially when we start talking about peak ratios and things of that nature, which we can talk about uh, further on in the video. But yeah, that's it's probably just fine, I would say. I think my only my only... A reservation with the 20 plus is for males and 30 plus for females is um, you're then you're dieting just to get to a maintenance to then do a show prep later and I try to avoid that I suppose um, I don't want to diet somebody to have them have to diet again after a maintenance period uh, but I and, I and I'm not even sure if that's what you guys do I think maybe you run long diets with lots of refeeds that are super like week long or something like that. But I, I just try to avoid, I, I don't generally do refeeds. I don't generally have higher carb uh, blocks during my week. So it's pretty steady. And I think that leads to about the same average of carbohydrates, but I just, uh, I'm not into the, you know, cycling like this. So that's why I run more maintenance period based things in the middle of dieting so that the client can kind of get to that settling point hopefully hold and now the seven point is actualized and then they can die it down from there. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, many cuts, no, no refeeds, right? No. no refeeds. Okay. Um, what do you, got? do you do a uh, refeeds or mini cut? Yeah. It's like, it's there. Take it if you need it. Okay. Um, okay. Like if we're getting into 
some groovy parts of some training and it's like, oh, you know, it's like I, I strongly consider maybe you take this a few days before and hey, catch up. And most of those are for performance upkeep, right? Yeah. Yeah. More than anything. Very few people. Yeah. Again, like if, if you crack under a mini cut, it's like maybe you shouldn't be mini cutting. <laughs> for, yeah. for sure, too. For sure. Fast, efficient fat loss. Does that sound like music to your ears? The mini cut movement might just be for you. Mini cuts are like robbing the fat bank. You want to get in and out with as much fat as possible. In a short period of time, you could easily look to lose six to 12 pounds of fat. The mini cut movement is excellent. There's group support for extra accountability and also expert help within the group. We have educational videos to keep you on track along the way and you get all your nutrition and training customized and individualized for you. So if that sounds of interest, get involved with the mini cut movement. Awesome. Yeah, I think it that's actually I'm glad you asked that Jared because that isn't a question I even had written down if taking refeeds, but um that is something that people often ask kind of uh, I guess there is no black and white you should take refeed shouldn't, but like both of you just mentioned you hopefully aren't taking the refeed for a psychological need and you mentioned before Jared that if your performance is dropping potentially you're losing a bit quick and I guess the refeed if it's helping performance it would slow down the rate of loss anyway, so maybe it's kind of in there as a security measure in that sense, I guess, like Alberto was saying. Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, the performance loss is occurring on maintenance volume, which is literally just volume to help you maintain your muscle tissue. Something's probably off there. Uh, the refeed might uh, take you up to the calories you actually should have been eating uh, for a brief period of time, and then that can help with performance. So that maybe it's a smart idea. If someone is saying like, hey, hey coach, uh, I was supposed to do three sets of eight with literally like 80% of my max and I just couldn't do it. Uh, probably refeed time and we'll, we'll see how performance is in a few days time. And on that note, Alberto is what does training during the mini cut look like for you? Is it different to other phases? Um, how do you like to go about that? Um, you know, honestly, I think initially it can start more or less where it was in the off season or like during the peak bulk. Um, and one thing that you, you, it's very common is that, you know, for most people that when they start their, their, their fat loss phase, like they're, they're very excited and amped and they like refuse to like lose strength. Um, so I think it's a lot of things. I think it's, it's mostly just, yeah, one is excitement and they probably, the little leakage they might have had when it comes to like lifestyle things, like they might have gotten that like stuff together again. And it's where it's like they're, they're just sleeping more, keeping stress under control. Um, you know, just all those little loose strings or they're keeping track of those things better. I know I do. Like once it's time for fat loss, like it's like, ah, oh, you know what? Yeah, I can go on that hike, but I think I'll uh, I'll save it till like after this so that I can you know, save my limited energy for, for what's going on in the gym. So, um, so training, we can usually start it there. Um, and then usually I reevaluate blocks with someone who I know quite well, say like every three, four weeks, and then kind of see how they're ticking, make them go through their checklist, and then we can change it from there. But uh, at most, maybe we'll see like an 80, a 20% decrease from like where they started. Um, in terms of volume. Yeah, 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 in terms of volume. Cool. And so, yeah, I guess it's not like it's, you haven't prepared it to be a different phase of training. It's as what we were, but we might modify if we need to, and likely mostly a volume change, or if something else crops up, then we'll change it if we need to. And it's usually the very big, strong males that require it. Um, even like pretty advanced, like strong females, like they seem to just hang on to strength, like scary well, like even through a contest prep sometimes it's like, should we really be lifting that strong? So it's more common with males. I feel that like we need to adjust something at a certain point where it's like, okay, you know, like maybe we shouldn't be hitting six sets of squats in the five hundreds anymore. Um, you know, so, um, so yeah, yeah. Usually, usually about 20% is the most I see because it's pretty short lived anyways. You know, cool. Jared, how I know you already mentioned kind of volume wise, you're looking like Alberto said, like the starting, volumes of a mass mesocycle which may, minimum effective volume for a mass which is probably your maintenance for that mini cut Gamal, okay, sorry uh, albert to just clarify you have about a 20 percent reduction from the volume you were doing in your final block of massing mm -hmm. and, and keep in mind like we usually run things like in a pretty linear fashion most of the time right, right. Right. Yeah. yeah so um 
this is touching on basically what we would call point three uh, of why you run mini cuts for uh, the appearance or temporary uh, to potentiate more massing. Um, so the reason that we potentiate more massing with mini cuts, there's a few reasons. I'm not going to show my whole deck of cards, you know, mini cut manual, you know what I'm saying? But reason number three, because we already touched on two, because Alberto brought it up earlier, is that resensitization to training volumes. And this is why I say I wouldn't really run uh, more than one mini cut in a macro cycle or six months to a year time frame. Um, because you only buy yourself so much time each time you run a mini cut for how much volume you're going to be able to do after that and how much muscle that's going to put on. So you have pathways in the body. We, you talk about these all the time, AMBK, mTOR, other catabolic and anabolic processes that are going on. And we have to do this sort of resensitization. Uh, and if you are not doing that during the mini cut, then you're kind of just doing more high volume during the mini cut. And that's just going to lead to potential overuse injuries. You don't ever actually resensitize any of these mechanisms. You're not getting as much out of the list that you would as far as muscle growth goes. And then if you would have resensitized these mechanisms. So you have to keep in consideration that hypochloric dieting in itself stresses more catabolic processes. Cardio in itself stresses more catabolic processes. So if the main point of this is to potentiate more massing and we want to do as little damage as far as stress and catabolic processes as possible or hypochloric, um, we probably shouldn't do cardio because that's also another stimulus, uh, stimulation of that, those pathways. And we should probably drop the volume so we can resensitize these pathways so that when we do go back to massing, we now have the means to put on muscle tissue like we want to. So not to mention there are some fiber type shift, uh, characteristics shifting. So the longer you run high volumes, the longer you do cardio, the longer you hypochloric diet, uh, you might see a shifting of fiber type characteristics, not fiber types per se, just the characteristics because there are some breakdown things going on in there, additions of uh, certain uh, regulators of, of metabolism, uh, angiogenesis is occurring. So as you run these high volumes, slow twitch fiber characteristics are more prominent and faster fibers start to kind of dwindle, dwindle, dwindle. We want to resensitize that as well. So during your mini cut itself, you might want to cut the volume back. 20% sounded pretty damn good to me, which is why I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. I didn't realize you guys did that. Uh, we say you should basically be running your MEV for your massing period is going to be your maintenance volume for your mini cut because you can't just run regular maintenance volumes. Maintenance volumes would be run, ran in an isocaloric state. So when you are maintaining your body weight, and if that's the case, you're, you're isocaloric during that time. You're not hypocaloric. So the second you try to go hypocaloric on regular maintenance volumes, well, that sets you up to lose some muscle tissue probably, probably. Um, so I maintenance volume is probably MEV for your massing. If, if, if again, if performance is going to the shitter, maybe you need a little bit more uh, advanced guys for sure. Um, I think that's pretty damn good start is that MEV for, for your massing uh, females. I, th I think I really, I really like the Alberto touch on that because I, d I do see that during mini coats, I'm kind of keeping their volume a little higher than that MEV for massing. It's a little bit higher. Um, but yeah, I think that, Lastly, and this isn't really talked about in the book, so this is, I, I just kind of thought about this today. Me and Mike had this sort of conversation. Um, we're resensitizing all these mechanisms. And then there's one thing that we're also resensitizing, and that's kind of like the variations that we're using. So if we were doing the similar patterns, so high bar squat, leg press, and it was all the same over and over, we might be able to go ahead and uh, put in some variations during this mini cut that aren't the same stressors that we were doing for. 20 or six months so 20 weeks or six months of, of massing because that's how you kind of run into overuse injuries right so you might go ahead and add in the uh variations that you're going to use for the second block of massing after this mini cut so that might be going from a high bar narrow stance squat to hack squats it might be going from leg press to, to lunges or whatever it may be um probably a good time to go ahead and, and sprinkle those in there because not only are you going to resensitize you know, pination angle or, or tug on the actual fibers from the joint, uh, but you're also going to resensitize um, joint stresses, things like that, that have already been taxed over and over and over. So incorporating these new variations leads to that novelty effect, which actually probably pretty damn good for the mini cut as well, because that's going to help you hold on to tissue that much better. You've now incorporated novelty effect. 
you're running an MEV for your massing, which is maintenance volumes, and you're hypocaloric and you're ready to kind of just cut a little bit of fat really quickly and get out and start massing again. Cool. Any, any thoughts on that, Alberto? I, I guess particularly potentially cardio, is that something that you're also a fan of kind of trying to keep cardio out of the, the, the mini cut phases? Uh, one quick thing on just especially smaller females, like it's really amazing how quickly they clear fatigue. So when we're say, man, and this is like on pretty advanced, like female power lifters, like, you know, they're pulling like close to 400, over 400, you know, and they're like 115, 120 pounds. Um, like you run them literally into the ground until like six, seven days out. And they might still have some heavy pressing sessions in there. And then you just pull it and they're good. Whereas like with a lot of your bigger guys, sometimes like you start out like at three, four weeks and it's like, okay, you know what? You, you hit PRs on your YOLO days after the meet. So it's just crazy how usually it, it depends on how big the system is, right? And, and like how, um, how strong the athlete is like that. That's, it's just, it, it plays such a huge role. Like when it comes to, to managing fatigue, um, so anyhow, it's just, it's scary. Cause some of the stuff I write for like female powerlifters were smaller. I'm like, Oh my God, like I'm, I'm going to kill you, but they, they make it out just fine. Um, cardio. Um, so men, I think typically can get away with it without it because, you know, we're just bigger burden, more at rest. Um, there's less repercussions for underfeeding us usually. Um, females a little different. Um, I'll throw in some cardio but it's not nearly to the point where, you know, like towards the end of a contest prep, it's like, we might be doing more cardio, like than than lifting at some point. And that's just the reality of like getting lean. I and mean, that used to be a rule of thumb. Like there's something really wrong. It's like, yeah, there's something, if you want to make it like, you know, it is like people brag about the amounts of cardio they're doing or their, their, their macros and stuff like that. And it's like, but the goal is to make it, you know, to look right on that stage. Uh, but, but, Prep uh, mini cut wise, um, honestly, like three, four sessions is about right. Which, to be honest, for a lot of females is kind of sort of what they're doing anyways. Like we don't even change it because, say, they work a sedentary job, and usually, most sedentary folks, I have them doing like three or four like sessions of some sort of light cardio, which usually plays the role of um, just enhancing recovery and obviously a little buffer there because like you don't move all day. Um, so we might bump that up maybe like by a third of what it usually is and that's fine. So um, maybe double it sometimes, but, um, but yeah, females usually get some cardio unless, I don't know, they're a personal trainer and they're on their feet all day. They're a server and they're moving around all day. Um, but um but yeah, uh, step counts is definitely one thing we do take into consideration because a lot of um, what I think at some point I saw is metabolic adaptations. At the end, it was just, you know, it goes, it's like they send you their pictures and you're like, your room just keeps getting messier and messier every fucking week, right? Um, it's because you're not doing anything. So the step counts just really encourage, you know, good habits. Like, you know, park a little further away, you know, uh, I know that when I'm dieting, it's like I live in a two uh, four house, and like sometimes if I leave something downstairs, I'm like, you, I'm not gonna get it. I'm just not worth, it, you know. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's that's plays a much smaller role than it would during a contest prep. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So again, that's that's for me. It's no additional cardio on top of what they probably already are doing. So like he said, you're you're not just getting rid of cardio completely for somebody who's working an office job anyway. So they're just basically keeping their uh, activity level the same, even through the mini cut, because I think an additional component of cardio during the mini cut kind of negates the, the, the entire reason of why we're going in there for, for reason three that I discussed, uh, which was that resensitization mechanism. Um, it, it, I don't think like one third additional cardio is gonna fucking ruin that or anything. So it's probably fine to do some, but I think that most of it should just come from the diet. You should just get in, get out, and be on your way for more massing, potentiate that massing, uh, more growth. And yeah, for sure. Just you know, I don't think I don't think a little bit of added cardio is gonna yeah. kill anything. I think it's probably fine. Uh, I I think adding in 
contest prep style cardio and really blasting it's probably a terrible idea and again just get in most of it should be from a deficit most of the mini cuts should be from that deficit that you uh went off of your maintenance calories in the beginning and get in get out cool so. I, I think this is probably the final thing in terms of training related questions um kind of we've got the idea that you're kind of keeping your volume kind of you're not pushing higher volumes you're kind of keeping it towards your lower baseline that you might have during a kind of hypertrophy mass phase uh but in terms of kind of training and kind of adaptations what about rep ranges or kind of the use of metabolite work if you are incorporating that potentially um not even incorporating that in terms of different phases but is there anything there that you're kind of more towards avoiding or removing or is it not something you're kind of too concerned about i don't know if you want to start jared and then move over to alberto Sure. So when I am taking somebody through a massing block, which is, you know, consecutive massive cycles of massing, generally toward the end of their massing, they're at their highest volumes. And that does come with some intensity techniques being used. So that can be occlusion, drop sets, supersets, whatever that may be. And because they're using those and because one of the potential mechanisms for this uh, resensitization is uh, angiogenesis occurs, the higher that you or the more that you use these intensity techniques which actually makes them worse so they don't work for long periods of time so keeping those in in the mini cup might be a bad idea uh resensitizing those mechanisms so you can get back to using them in your massing is probably a good idea so that's another thing that you're kind of resensitizing during this period of time i think that you know the last two months of massing the last month of massing whatever it may be you're utilizing more of these techniques so it's probably a good idea to go ahead and take them out in the mini cut lose a bunch of rapid fat, get back to massing, and then start incorporating these things again and going up and up, up in volume. Are you any different there, Alberto? Um, so the intensity techniques, usually that's um, something just more reserved for like late intermediate um, and more so just to develop a sweet tooth for it or, or more so thick enough skin because it's like they're going to be your friend like going into the advanced stage. So it's like, let's... Let's learn to work this hard. Um, so, um, so yeah. So it, it, I use those for late, intermediate, advanced athletes. Basically, almost all use them, and um, I get rid of them mostly because of just safety. Um, yeah. Um, so it, it's the thing I miss the most when I am um, when I am mini cutting. It's, it's like my my training is is so missionary, basically. You know. Um, and uh, maybe a little bit of the um, the super high rep stuff um, kind of goes away, because um, I, I have seen in 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 my own experiences that you know when someone just has a cocktail of like many different rep ranges, it's grow better. Um, but still, I believe the majority of the work is going to come like through that like. I guess those traditional loads and the traditional work, you know, the, whatever it might be, everyone has different ranges, but you know, somewhere in like the five to 12 rep range, something like that. So we keep most of that, but a lot of the cuts come from like the other stuff. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, we definitely, that's, that's where we cut the fluff that, that 20%, I guess, is from, from the intensity and the high, high, super, um, intensive work. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it's cool. You've kind of got to the same kind of programming methodology, but through different kind of ways of thinking about it. And I guess that's because you both practiced it and found this to be the the kind of the solution that you need. And that's why I love yeah, about you in these chats. We're, we're also all looking at the same data. We're just, um, our conjecture might be a little different on some points, you know, yeah. uh, we theorize and that's why it's theory. And, um, sometimes, we theorize slightly different, uh, then we put them into practice and, uh, that's how science works. You know, they, they, they read the data one way and somebody else read the data another way and here's the conjecture and let's do some tests and then, Oh, now we can be more accurate in the future. So that's why a lot of the stuff is crass, uh, crossing and it's crossing in like, you might see me and Alberto diverging these ways and they're like, Oh shit, they're doing the same exact thing. They're just saying it differently. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's really cool to hear him talk about them. Actually. I'm like, Oh shit. Cool. That does all basically the same thing. We end up in a lot of the same places, like you said, road, different yeah. roads. Oh, I didn't think you were going to be here, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like when I was in Colorado, you didn't think I was going to be there? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, what's he doing here? <laughs>
Fantastic. I guess um, we've kind of gone through actually who they're for, who they're not for, rate of loss, uh, training adjustments that we might make, which is fantastic. And uh, I think probably talked about some of the benefits in terms of like the resensitization. Uh, P ratios was something you brought up, Jared. So I don't know if you want to touch base on that again, just to explain what yeah, kind of I, P I, ratio I, I is. I certainly can. Yeah, yeah, if you'd like me to. So um, this P ratio improvement is basically uh, the first reason that we would say it potentiates more massing. Uh, a likely uh, contribution to why the P ratio is better in leaner people is because muscle insulin sensitivity decreases a lot faster than fat insulin sensitivity uh, as you accumulate fat. So basically, the more fat you gain, the more nutrients go to fat. Um, that's why I think getting uh, upper 20 plus for males is probably a bad idea. P ratio kind of just, it's less auspicious for muscle gain when you get up there. Uh, but if somebody's, you know, hammering and training and they're in a groove and it's like, fuck, their performance is beautiful, whatever, you know, keep going. There's no reason in destroying that or taking away their, their steam. So because, but I, because the P ratio is becoming a bit skewed and depending on genetically who's putting on more muscle, who's not, uh, other things are taken into consideration here. Again, you can read the book. We, we have a lot of this laid out in detail. Uh, I think that's a smart idea to go ahead and do this mini cut. And that puts the P ratio back into favor for uh, muscle gain. Um, this is, this is a pretty interesting point that I would touch on. That might trigger in somebody's head, okay, you're saying insulin sensitivity, this and that. So does that mean I should cut my carbohydrates during my mini cut? Um, it's, it's pretty well shown that just losing the body fat, and it doesn't matter if it's you dropping your carbs or you dropping from mostly fats or just an even range, insulin sensitivity improves for muscle or muscle insulin sensitivity and decreases obviously for the fat. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're losing that from just uh, reducing the carbohydrates, which you do not have to do. There's no reason to making yourself suffer that much. It's kind of stupid. <laughs> or if it's coming from just even distribution of nutrients. So I think it's a good idea to maybe slightly raise the protein because it's an aggressive diet. Uh, keep the carbohydrates pretty similar to the massing and cut the fucking cats, the fats down. A 0.3 grams per pound, maybe even a little lower because it's not a sustainable fat loss approach. It's a very fucking rapid and fast fat loss approach. So you can keep carbs high. This is going to help with people not feeling as flat. You're still going to get flat because you don't have the inflammation from the excessive training volume. You don't have, you're kind of going down in that. You don't have uh, more nutrients. So you're actually, you're in that weird, you're going to go, basically you're going to go from mass way up looking fucking awesome to that weird period in time during your prep where you're like still fat, but smaller. That's a mini cut. <laughs> that's where you're going to end. So don't expect to look like a God by the end of the mini cut. And if you are, stop, uh, stop, <laughs> it's just get that out of your head. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a good idea to, uh, improve this P ratio. And I think there are some very good, uh, as far as conjecture goes from physiology, there's some very good physiological rationales like insulin sensitivity for muscle versus fat as to why we should do this. But that's definitely one mechanism by which it probably occurs. Cool. Yeah, I think um, I, Alberto, you might have to correct me, but Jeff Alberts calls it like the tweener stage or something uh, where That's you funny. just look like <laughs> fat and flat. <laughs> That's well, funny. Your shirt's like, you know, they're not as tight anymore, but it's like, but it's also not like cut up, right? Exactly. <laughs> like you said, Jared, it's like the goal is not to look fantastic. I've, I've goofed up myself where it's like, hey, you know, this is going like really well. I mean, if I just push out like another four weeks, I think... Uh, I, I, I look really cool and that never really works out well. So yeah, the goal is to set yourself up for that next leg and, uh, and not look fantastic. Uh, I think especially at the end of mini, I, I don't look as good as I do. Like I, I, to me, off season is where I look the best in my clothes. Um, where it's like, Oh, he looks like he lifts, you know, and it's, it's, I kind of lose a little bit of that, but I'm still not like needing to take off my shirt at the pool party. Either, so. Yeah, and it's it's tough because people will compare. So like if I do a mini cut, I'm very genetically gifted in my fat distribution. So at the end of my mini cut, people are gonna be like, Well, I thought in that podcast Jared said you shouldn't look that great. And it's like my fat comes off my midsection. So maybe I'll just post pictures of my jiggly ass and love handles. So that way people can can see that my mini cut was was like theirs. So uh and you also are gonna be comparing it to previous mini cuts that you've done. And if you got a little bit fatter. And this block and this uh, macro cycle of massing, and you're doing a mini cut, 
opposed to this block a year ago, you're going to look not as good. You're going from 20% to 15% opposed to 15% to 10%. So it's don't compare your, your too many cuts if you realize you goofed up and you got a little too fat, a little fatter than you wanted. And also try not to just run into that problem. Nobody said you had to finish a block of massing. So we were discussing this before, Steve. You want to run 20 weeks of massing straight. If you realize by week 17, even though that's week two of the, the mesa cycle for your final mesa cycle, if you realize, man, I'm a little getting a little over fat, you could just take the calories to 250 increase a day or down to maintenance or just fucking start the mini cut. <laughs> like, you know, you can just throw it in there and, and you'll be fine. Uh, you could also just take a, a light week and then, then into the mini cut. And that might be a little smarter, but, um, nobody said you had to get over fat. And, and if you noticed you did, then that's kind of like point four of like a TIA is what we call TIA temporary improved appearance. And this goes into more like, sometimes there are people who are, there are people who are going to see this and they're like influencers. They don't give a fuck about bodybuilding. They have, they have sponsorships, they influence people on Instagram, they do whatever. Um, and they have random Under Armour calls them up. They're like, Hey, photo shoot in, in four weeks. And it's like, so you might want to run a TIA mini cut. Uh, training volume might be a little higher because you want that inflammation in the muscle tissue, things like that. You might even run a peak at the end of that. Um, but that type of mini cut is, is probably a little more psychologically draining and a little bit, uh, I, I wouldn't try to run those. That's more keen to like what, what Lane was doing, I would say. Probably not a good idea. But if you're an influencer or a sponsor and you have a photo shoot coming up and you're in the middle of your massing, you're at week 15 and your sponsor all of a sudden calls you up and they're like, hey, we have a photo shoot and we want you to look good in our fucking clothes. I mean, you're, you're going to look good in their clothes. You're getting paid by these people. So then that's when you consult with your coach and you say, hey, I need to kind of run this TIA mini cuts. And uh, you, you just approach it that way. And after that, uh, I, we can probably talk about this later, but there's some things to expect afterwards that that um, will probably help psychologically if we talk about them with everyone. So, yeah, PIA is an acronym for something. Yeah, uh, it was temporary improved appearance. Okay, okay, okay. It's just like the second reason that we would say you would want to run a mini cut. It's 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 the reason that I would not tell people to mini cut for the most part. But if it's somebody's job to look good for a company, then let's. If you have a coach, which you probably should. Let's do let's let's run this for you because you you do want to good in their clothes and you want to maintain sponsorship and you and you want to make sure that you're getting paid. So I get it. it it's something that I would try to talk people out of. I'd be like, is there any chance that they're okay with the look you have currently and we can just maintain this and kind of still run high volumes, or do you have to get a little leaner? Um, so it's definitely a conversation. But if it's something they have to do, hopefully this rarely happens, then I, I would be okay with running that with them. And then uh, afterwards, helping them through that psychologically, because there's some baggage and shit that's going to come with that. Yeah, I think that's actually a really cool point to touch on just quickly is like, what do you, I mean, I'm guessing both of you have had to do this. How do you talk a, uh, an athlete, let's call it, out of doing a mini cut? Like, I, I assume both of you have had to do that. Is there any kind of things you press upon to kind of get them convinced that actually it's not the right thing for them right now? I, I don't know if you want to start, Alberto. Yeah, Alberto. I would love to hear what Alberto has to say. Um, shoot. Yeah, just I, I think remind them of the end goal because sometimes that can be so abstract that um, you know, we forget why we're doing this. And it's like, just put in their head, it's like, Imagine when you just like lined up with those dudes and you're about to get up on that stage, right? It's like you're you want to know that you did everything right to get there because it's gonna feel shitty. Like if you're there and you're like, "Fuck, I'm about to get spanked," and uh, I, I know exactly where I took those wrong turns, and you're you're going to be more mad. Not necessarily at the, the the honest mistakes where it's like, okay, something to to learn from next next go around, but the ones where you got in your own way. So reminding them of, of their end goal essentially and then perhaps enticing them a little bit with like what we might have on deck like we're so close to like we're going to be doing this i think this lift will get to this point we're going to start including this thing back things like that um so yeah yeah both i guess the long long term and then like just like what's right around the corner so waving those carrot sticks love that are you similar jared yeah absolutely um if somebody comes to me with Steve, you come, you come to me before. Um, oh yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to run, a, I want to run a third mini cut and we literally just sit down, we have a conversation and I'm like, why? And you, you have to list out your whys. And then all I have to do is provide a perspective. Um, 
And if that perspective outweighs your why, then you generally change your mind yourself because you're a smart cat. Uh, um, and and I, I like to think, you know, most of our clients are. So I, that's just a conversation of them discussing why they believe this with me. And generally that comes down to, they just want to look good right now. And if that's the end of the conversation, then I just put that, you know, so what you're saying is you want to look good right now. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, mm, probably not a good idea. <laughs> hey, Hi. Pascal here. I just quickly wanted to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we put a huge emphasis on the personal aspect of our coaching. And if you want to take your physique and knowledge to the next level, hit the link in the description below. I still hate you for making me force feed myself for another month. That was <laughs> one of the hardest months I've ever lived. But I can, yeah, it, did, it did pay off, I think. So um, yeah, actually, I think that's a really nice point there because for like I can just say to the listeners, I went to someone who I respect for their opinion. It didn't matter what you said, actually. Whatever you said, I was going to be like, like, I trust your opinion. That's what I needed. So I think as a coach, hopefully you have that relationship with the client already. And I expect as soon as you both say that those kind of convincing words, like put those carrots in front, your client's like, okay, I, I kind of knew you were going to say that. I was just like testing the water a little bit with you to see, see what you might say. For sure. And they'll do that. They'll test the waters. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you know they just want to come to you when they're having one of those moments, and 100%. It's, it's a question, but it's more so they they know it's right, and they just want that that confirmation, not the information. Yeah. That's a huge reason people have coaching. They 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 want to be consistent. They want affirmation that they're doing well, and that's why we're here. Um, give you the plan. You're you're the man. You're the one doing it, and we're just here to to let you know if you're on the right track or if you're. If you're going off the rails a little bit, we're like, hey, come on, let's have a conversation. Let's get you back on track. And that's what they want. So that's why they, you know, that's why they come to a coach. Absolutely. It's not magic per se, because I think most of the people who sign up for our stuff, it's like they 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 know how shit works. It's just, you know, yep. you find the the human element of the whole emotional thing in there. And it's it's yeah, a big conflict of interest happens and we're literally there to uh, just yeah, 100%. And we all do it too. Like I've seen 3DMJ coaches coach each other. Um, I, I spit all ideas off Steve, off Mike, off like whenever I'm in the, into prep, I'm like, man, I don't think I'm ready. You know, we, we all have to have that at some point. It's it's not just our clients. The coaches need it too. It, the highest educated coaches. I, I'm constantly having conversations with Mike. He's like, man, I don't know. Am I lean enough? And this and that. And this and I'm like, Mike, here, listen, let's sit down and have a conversation. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's something we all need. Human connection is never going to go away so awesome and i think just to finish after the mini cup i think this is something that some people i see questions about this all the time shall i reverse my calories what shall i do um so i'd love to hear your guys perspective on this and um i don't know if jared do you want to start off with like what's your approach post mini cup for people training Absolutely. nutrition yeah, yeah, yeah. so first and foremost you're going to have to realize there's probably going to be an initial increase at a one-to-one -one ratio of the initial decrease that you saw in the beginning of the mini cut, right? Body water. It's body water. And that's going to come in the form of sub Q water, uh, some bloating, which is you're going to, you're going to be farting more too because you're not used to that much food uh, and intramuscular water. So you're going to look full. You're going to look better and it's going to start right away, but you have to be okay with the weight gain coming. So if you lost four pounds right away week one, uh, probably going to gain three to four of that back week one of the, of the mass. And that can be done literally just by coming off the mini cut up, up your calories to pre mini cut maintenance calories, pre mini cut maintenance calories, body, body water is going to come with that. And then by week three, you can probably make those adjustments for that 0.25 to 0.5% body fat increase or, or body weight increase as you mass up. So maintenance calories for the first two to three weeks. If you can, you got to stick it out. You got to rough it out. You just did a mini cut. You have to recover from the mini cut and then start the increase after that. But you're going to feel a lot better just from the intramuscular uh, glycogen, just from seeing the scale go up a little bit. Your clothes fill out a little more. Um, but there is going to be some bloating because you're not used to that much food and you're not used to the sub-Q water is going to come with that. So you have to be okay with that and you have to um, wait, be consistent and wait for that two, three week mark, two and a half, three week mark before you start making that increase for the initial massing gain you want to see. Awesome. And then just training wise, you do you throw in a deload at the end and, and then get into the next phase of training? 
Um, I generally do if it's a longer mini cut. So if somebody's running a two week mini cut, it might not be necessary. Um, and that generally is more with like people that I coach that are enhanced. I don't ever really see uh, a natural guy doing a two week mini cut. Uh, I've, I've had some natural guys run three to four week mini cuts. Um, but generally the longer the mini cut, you're probably going to need to deload after that. It's five weeks of training volume that you're running that you're maintaining with, which is, it's, that's not, uh, <laughs> no training volume, it's accumulating some fatigue. So it's probably a good idea to dissipate the fatigue, especially since you were so fucking hypocaloric that you're gonna run into some issues if you just try to go right into massing. So I think the longer the mini cut, uh, if the mini cut exceeds two, two, three weeks and you're not enhanced, it's definitely a good idea to do a deload no matter what, so. Awesome, Alberto, anything different on that? I think we end up at similar places uh, again. Um, so post mini, when it comes to calories, is usually I have a good handle on where a person's calories are at. And um, some people are very adaptive relative to others, like, like one or two weeks adaptive. Like that's enough for their body to like, uh, we're doing, and then there's some folks that it's like, how did your genetics make it this far? Because you can keep losing the ever. Um, so, Everyone's going to be a little banged up, you know, a little differently, you know, again, the length and just individual differences. And um, so usually it's like, let's just say if this person's maintenance was like 14.1 calories per pound, right? We just apply that to the smaller version of them, but we take into consideration the fact that you're either adaptive, you're not. Some people, as they get lighter, myself included, I just get more wiggly. Like it's like, I just, I move around more without necessarily realizing. Um, so usually like it's, it's about the same, if, if not a little bit more, and it just seems like on a per pound basis, like I, I guess I, I lose, um, yeah, it works the other way for some folks, but nevertheless, so yeah, based off that, like how long was a cut? How do they usually respond to fat loss in regards to, you know, how adaptive are they? Um, on the training front, um, yeah, I think starting, I can start the, like, like you guys, like my training blocks, like, you know, pretty, pretty easy. It's like, Hey, let's build up some momentum. You know, let's, we shouldn't be hitting PRs the first week yeah, because yeah, I do, we do run something differently once that cut is over. It's like, okay, this is our program for the estimated length of our fat loss phase. Okay. Now it's done. We definitely need a week that is either a deload or super similar to a deload. Sometimes they don't want to deload because they're excited to get back on on the other side of things i'll um i'll throw something that's kind of like the pill is hidden in there it's just fun in different ways you know ways that are not taxing and maybe conducive to recovering slightly different ways um but yeah we start off slow build good momentum um let things kind of untangle a little bit before we we really step to it and then yeah right around the three-ish week mark four-ish week mark um I think often some people, that's when they look their best. It's like now that they've been eating enough, they're like, oh, okay. Like a lot of the extra water retention is, is done now. And, um, and that's usually a sign that, okay, like let's really start getting into it. Let's really start to make the intake a little bit less ambiguous. And yeah, let's start going a little bit hard across the board with everything. Fantastic. I think we've actually covered pretty much every point. Um, I know Jared, you're a bit um, kind of time-wise, but actually I think we've pretty much covered each point. I don't know if either of you have anything more you wanted to add to the mini cut discussion, uh, but I think yeah. you guys have done a fantastic job. Yeah, first of all, I love these eclectic conversations where you have panels and people can derive their ideas off of all the stuff that they're hearing and make their own conjecture and and uh, come to the conclusions. It's, it's probably better that way instead of, you know, somebody watching one person and parroting everything they fucking said. So I like this a lot. Uh, you should do more of these. But uh, taking everything we just said into consideration, maybe I could lay out an example um, that we found as far as uh, calculating where to start. That might be good for somebody. Uh, just, for you know, first take everything we said into consideration and then here's kind of what we found. What do you think, is that a good idea? I, I don't think it's a bad idea. <laughs> okay, so, I don't know how it's going to look right now. <laughs> I'm just going to say like 200 pound male. If you're okay. a 200 pound male and you want to run a mini cut, here's kind of what we say. 0.75% uh, each week if you're running that upper range, five to six week mini cut. 
uh, 1.25% weight. Oh, this is in pounds. So 0.75 times your weight in pounds. Uh, or sorry, 0.75. You want to lose 0.75% of your body weight each week if it's a longer mini cut. And you would take your weight in pounds and multiply by 3.75. That's 3.75 calories for each pound body weight. And that's going to put you in that, that right deficit. Uh, if you want to lose 1.25% of your body weight, and, and then you would take your weight in pounds and multiply by 6.25. So you need about five calories per pound of body weight to be uh, in a deficit to achieve a rate of loss of 1%. So if this guy's 200 pounds, then that's 200 pounds times five is 1,000 calories, right? So that's per day. 1,000 times seven is 7,000. So that's an important number because what we generally use in the evidence-based community is that 3,500 calories equals one pound loss. So if this 200 pound male wants to lose 1% of his body weight, so he's doing a four week mini cut, if he wants to use 1% of his body weight, that's a 1000 calorie deficit for two pounds because that's 1%. Did I, did I uh, go out? Cause my thing is saying internet. No, no, we heard you. That's bang on. So perfect. 200 pounds. You want to lose 1% multiply by five. If you want to lose 1.25%, multiply by 6.25. If you want to lose 0.75% because you're running a six week mini cut, multiply by 3.75. And that's the deficit you need daily to create the change you want to see. Yep. So that's anywhere from 0.75% body weight loss per week to 1.25% body weight loss per week. And these are calculations we come up with off of more complex compl or calculations like the Harris Benedict or Steve, you, you always repost that one. Here's how you find your maintenance calories. Here's how you find your massing calories. Uh, so we've taken those calculations and we've just broken it down into a calorie. Uh, very simple. Multiply your body weight by these amount of calories and that's your deficit for the day. So it's super simple and you can read that in the makeup manual also. Um, very easy. Do you use the same sort of rule of thumb, Albert, of the three, five hundred calorie deficit for a pound on the week? Or do you use like percentages? Some people like to use a percentage deficit. Um. I kind of end up in the same place, but uh, via like most folks, it's like, uh, let's just touch the water with like nine, 10 calories per pound, you know, and see, see what that does. I, I do want people to lose a good amount the first week um, just because it feels good. You know, it's because it, here's this big rapid life change, right? It's like, it's like, you know, yeah, it sucked because you were like pouring down the food, but it's it's you know you switch gears and you're like oh that wasn't too bad about halfway through the first day uh, i kind of missed the, the bulk life so seeing a nice rapid chunk come off the first week i'll probably after the first week after the second week we might close it up a little bit but uh but yeah i want chunks to fly off like <laughs> we said the first week of like you know entering back to that gaining phase um you know it's going to start relatively easy and the same thing with the cutting phase it's like uh, you know the first week of your your mini cut block it's going to be pretty chill you know, so like, why not? Um, so, so yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty hardcore. Um, and that's why, again, it's probably best for competitors, but there is that demographic there. Those, those hardcores that, you know, we see at the gym and it's like, you've never competed. Um, I, I think for, for those folks it's like, this is, this is super appropriate as, as well. So not to, cause I think that's a large chunk of the people who probably listen to your podcast. Absolutely, it's like, yeah compete but i'm really freaking serious about this and outside of the like i'm gonna diet down to the point that i can't get a boner no more this is this is pretty awesome they live the best bodybuilding <laughs> life <laughs> but, right the answer is usually in the middle man right awesome yeah. generally people are very serious not only about fat loss if they're only serious about fat loss this is not for them people who are also very serious about muscle gain probably for them Perfect. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Um, like Jared said, I, I love getting people together and especially, yeah, I mean, two people I really respect talking about a subject and just seeing you go back and forth. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool to see. And I'm glad you appreciate the dis these discussions because sometimes the best things come out of them. Um, so yeah, hopefully we can, I'd like to do some more of them in future. Uh, yeah. Thank you both. Um, I want to make sure actually, I don't want to kind of assume people know where you are. Uh, if people want to reach out to Alberto, where should they head? 
Okay, 3dmusclejourney.com, and um, I think most of our activity takes place on the gram, so you can find myself and the rest of the team there. And uh, yeah, we keep we keep busy, and uh, it's not just us. We have a collection of just a bunch of dope people, registered RDs, uh, therapists, and staff. It's um, yeah, it's been it's been dope to see us just start from like just three dudes that like would catch shows on the weekends and you know would write about them to like now you know it's like shoot like we got influence like be careful with what you say because because people take <laughs> you know, yeah. don't don't wear your 3d mj shirt in public <laughs> <laughs> with great power yeah. comes great responsibility <laughs> it's the best line <laughs> jared if people want to reach out to you uh where should they head yeah, sure. Uh, like he said, we have also Renaissance Periodization as a website, so I coach for RP. Um, RenaissancePeriodization.com. You can find me, like he said, most of my activities on Instagram, uh, most of the coaches' activities on Instagram. We have, like, a few coaches, most PhDs, RDs. It's amazing to work with staff as well. And then we also get to communicate with Eric and, and Alberto and Jeff often. We all, we're always having a conversation. It's awesome. Brian Miner, just everybody in the industry. It's fucking amazing. I love it. So if you're not following any of those people, make sure you do. And then I just started up a uh, YouTube again. So hopefully that gets some views, gets going, gets cranking. I'm actually showing my progression uh, from my mesocycle and why I make changes that I make during this video. I thought it would be a pretty, pretty cool concept. So if you guys have ever wondered why, how, what we do with our training volume and uh, how it's increasing throughout a block of training, I'm over on YouTube trying to explain to the best of my abilities how that's done. Hopefully it gets, it gets across well and uh, people, people find merit in it. I know Alberto's just started up the vlogs again. So Ooh, baby. I got to come up with that. I got to prove it to, to myself first, but yeah. It's always, uh, from my perspective at least, when I'm viewing those, I really appreciate them because whilst it's not the same dense content that you get from like a, a podcast, when you see someone practically applying the information, you see them lifting, it's a, it's a different experience. You take home like things and you pick stuff up. So yeah, I mean, you're two people I would love to be training with, but at least I can watch you train and try and like pick up that inspiration from that. So I think a lot of people, I think people get more out of them than maybe you feel like they do because you might feel they're not as to know sciencey and academic is some of other things you can yeah, train I'm, and i'm sure you guys are too the guys that like train a little bit differently right so like when i see other folks doing something that like makes sense i'm like as cool as like this man was like back in the day and that would pump me up like that pumps me up just as much you know just um, use like that muscle awesome. you're able to train now steve yeah yeah we we have uh, our gyms have just opened this weekend Ooh. so Leg training is back on fire. I've I got I ended up getting a pretty decent setup from home, similar to what you had yeah. with Mike. But yeah, um, yeah it's, well, it's way better than that. We had to fucking tarp on top of we'll fill it up. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, again, thank you so much. Um, I think the listeners will have enjoyed this a lot. I hope this gets a lot of listens, a lot of shares, um, and yeah, appreciate you always. Take care, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Right on. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're going to have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. 
the exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy. We're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.